Amen. Good morning again. Well, as I said, Pastor D called me last week. I call him Pastor D. It's Pastor Delbert for those that are visiting. Um, most of the time I just call him Delbert. That's his name. So anyway, we get all hung up on titles and things like that. But Jesus says, I'm the son of man. He also says, I'm Jesus. So anyway, so he asked me to, uh, to speak. I wanted to know if I had anything ready. And I'm like, yeah, always. Um, I've been on a journey for the last year. Some of you have been here with me as I've shared uh, that journey in the uh, last few times that I've shared. Today is kind of the summary. Today is kind of where, uh, where I finish. Amen. Um, hey, look out now. That was my wife. It's okay for her to comment and say, yeah, I'm glad you're finished. She knows where I'm coming from. Finishing the journey. Let me recap just a little bit if you weren't here over the last year. And if you weren't, then shame on you. You should have been here over the last year. All right? Unless, of course, you're going to another church and then you need to come here. So um, that's just my, I'm not a real heavy sales pitch, right? Okay. So let me recap just a little bit. Uh, for the past uh, six years, maybe, something like that, I get up every morning and I have to take this little pill. Every morning, and I can't miss it. Because if I miss it, somebody gets hurt. One way or the other, physically, emotionally, uh, whatever, right? There's no shame in that for me anymore. Uh, about, what, I, I guess it's been eight months ago, I told everybody, there's no shame in that for me anymore. Uh, reason being is because my brain doesn't function properly. It used to, but over years of stress and strain and different, different things that have happened and the experiences that I've had, it's changed the way that my brain functions, okay? If you get specific, there's a little part of my brain called the amygdala. And what happens is through the stresses and the, the things that I've experienced in life, that things get swollen. And so when it's swollen, it's what controls your emotions and all the things like that. So what happens is my emotions get out of control either one way or the other, either up, way up or way down. You can call that whatever you want to, but the doctors call it post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's what I've been treated for for the last six or seven or so years. And I love the commercials that's come out now from our soldiers. You know, have you seen those where the soldiers come back and said, I left and went over to Afghanistan or over to Iraq, and when I came back, I was changed. I wasn't changed on the outside, but I was changed on the inside. And I found out I couldn't function anymore in society, so I've been treated for it. And so now I find I can deal with post-traumatic stress disorder. And the last line was, was uh, yes, I have post-traumatic stress disorder, but I don't have to live that way. And I thought that was an excellent commercial because it's starting to bring to light some of the things that people uh, are beginning or have experienced. And a lot of times when we suffer, suffer from those kinds of disorders and things, we get embarrassed, we get ashamed about it and that kind of stuff. I am no longer embarrassed about it. I'm no longer ashamed about it. In fact, I just tell everybody, look, I take medication to keep me calm, okay, to keep me not, to make me nice. <laughs> and we call it Terry's happy pill. And uh, if I start getting ill and ugly, one of the first things out of my wife's mouth, did you take your medication today? And I'll go, oh, nope, I forgot, I gotta go take it. Or I'll go, yes, but it's just a rough day or whatever. So it, it's not a cure-all by any means. But, you know, if, you, if you're suffering from something and you don't know what it is, then seek help. That's, that was my point, okay? So that was kind of where the first sermon went, where the first one went, was kind of like, go ahead and deal with the issue. Don't keep, keep, putting it off, putting it off. The way mine came to light was very interesting is I suddenly, I stood there realizing everybody around me can't be wrong because that's what I thought. I'm the only right person in the world? Come on. Are you, you people are crazy. And then I realized, well, wait a minute. Everybody can't be wrong. Somebody in there has to be right. The odds, just the odds mathematically for me was enough to go. I need to go back and re-examine this just a little bit. And so I did, and I realized that all these people can't be wrong, even statistically. Something has to be wrong here, so I began to look at that, and so I began to say, maybe I need some help. So I got help. That's how it happened for me, and that's where my journey started about six years ago. Now, about a year ago, some stressful things happened. Uh, we ended, well, a little over a year ago now, two years ago, just about, we... We've moved in with my mother, taking care of her. Don't regret a bit of it. It was just, it's been wonderful. It's getting better and better and better all the time. It's been a wonderful, great thing for us, but it was a very traumatic change for us to have to go through. 
because we had a daughter that's just gone to college. We had one that was halfway through, one that graduated from law school was in law, I mean, graduated from college was in law school. He was getting ready to graduate, so all the stresses and strain began to be more than I thought I could bear. So things started getting really, really rough, okay? And so I began to realize that without the treatments, without prayer, without the movement of the Holy Spirit, without God's help, without the love of my family, without all of that, where would I be? Where would I, where would I wind up if I didn't have all that type of support? If I didn't come to church? Just imagine where I would be if I didn't come in, in, and put myself in the presence of God or hook up with the body of Christ. At least come and listen to some of the elders go, you know, you're going to make it. Things are going to be okay. Listen to some of the, the folks who just come here that care about me. They, you know, maybe, maybe I don't see them and talk to them every day, but they do care about me enough to come up and say, everything's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. We've heard what you've done. This is going to be a great thing for you. So you see what I'm saying? It's kind of like a support group. So if nothing else, coming to church can be one of your best support groups. So if you hadn't gone and got help and seen the help of a professional, then this is, this is really, really, really good, okay? So you with me on that? So it came from that, that perspective, and all of a sudden I realized the things that go on inside me, I call it the monsters inside me. And here's what I said. Hollywood cannot dream up nowhere near close to what monster I can create right here in my own mind. The ugliest, deadliest, nastiest looking Freddy Krueger they can make up and create does not compare to the monster that I can create right here in my own mind. You're talking about scaring. You can scare yourself to death. Right. Hollywood can frighten you a little bit, but you can actually scare yourself to death with some of the things you can conjure up in your mind. Uh, here's a great example for fear. Um, always thinking that when your kid leaves the house when they turn 16 that they're not going to come back when they start driving. All the worst can happen. See what I'm saying? This is a constant fear there. Uh, here's one of the biggest fears my wife and I share for a long, long time is our kids being abducted. That's a huge fear, right? Hollywood makes movies about that stuff, but they can never capture the true fear that's inside the parent. They can portray it in a certain way, but they really can't get inside your mind like the enemy can and say, your kid may not come back. See what I'm saying? So you can live in fear there. Or even, even the, the demons, you know, even the ones that we create in our minds, you know, we think about what they might look like. They draw the horns on them and they paint them up, put them in these big, big suits and things, but they don't come near close to what you see in that imagination of yours. And Paul says your imaginations can run, run away with you, right? He also says don't become vain in your imaginations. So we're going to talk about imagining some things here in just, just a little bit too. So it went from the monsters inside me to dealing with fear. Fear is a strong, strong, strong emotion. It's also a good, strong way for the enemy to come after you, to, to, to just absolutely shut you down in fear. Now, my fear was not of any, any monster man or anything like that. My fear was losing family because we had gone through so much strain, so, so much stress. We lost my stepfather. Uh, we've been losing grandmothers and grandfathers over the last couple of years. So then all of a sudden reality hit me. Well, what in the world would happen if I lost my family? And, of course, God would take care of it. You put yourself in, in, you think about Job, what happened with him, you know, how much he gained back. But that fear was always there. Fear will cripple you. And so what I talked about is not allowing fear. Don't give fear a place. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of what? Of a sound mind. So where does fear really attack? It attacks in your mind. So to get that mind back together, you get away from that fear, then you have to get into God's Word. You have to understand that He's given you peace and security and joy and strength and all the things that God has given you to combat fear. And you don't have to be afraid. And we actually sing songs about it. You don't have to worry and don't you be afraid. And all those songs that we sing about fear and, and, uh, and coming against fear. So we don't have to live in fear, right? And then I talked about anger and rage because I'm an angry person. I still am an angry person. I'm an angry person in rehab. <laughs> this is rehab for me. Okay? Well, you shouldn't be angry. Well, you can't say that until you put yourself in my shoes. You will put yourself in my shoes for a little while and see how you feel. Right. Remember I talked about you, you take a dog that's been tied up on a leash for a while and, and the kid comes over and keeps whacking away at this dog with a stick, whacking away. Eventually, the dog is going to get up and bite you. So don't come whacking at me with a stick expecting me not to bite you. Don't pick at me. And here's what I call it every day. I say, don't poke at me. Stop poking at me. 
You know, if you don't have anything good, if you're not trying to come in with good intentions, if you're not coming to just make a good conversation, stop poking at me and go away. Give me some time to cool off and you can come back and we'll talk. But the constant poking will, will cause what I said, the hulk to come out. Remember the story about the hulk? What happened with the hulk is, and this is so true to my life, is the hulk had a daddy. And daddy had some strange intentions in life. Daddy was trying to create this monster. So his dad genetically altered the genes of himself and then passed that along to his son. And then his son became the hulk because of the, the gamma radiation, the, the things of life that polluted that gene experiment in him. All those things came bubbling up, and before long it was rage, and that rage turned him to the raging monster they call the Hulk, who just mindlessly smashed things. And I spent years smashing things. I did. I rage and rage and rage, smash, smash, and smash. The next thing you know, you got this wreck. You've got nothing but people that go, I don't even want to be around him anymore. He's so angry. So dealing with that anger was one. Dealing with rage, dealing with the fact that you can't control your temper, so, and, and you know, you get tested every day. When I go to the counter to get my medication, they start asking me nine million questions. <laughs> Did you not read what this is? <laughs> read, read the medication and then you'll stop asking me so many questions. You'll just go, here, you need to probably go take one of these and come back and we'll ask you some questions. <laughs> Do you, you follow what I'm saying? Not because I want to be that way, it's just something has happened. Throughout life, circumstances and things changed the way that I thought. And so now God is helping me correct that through this journey over the past year. Amen? Amen? So if we can change, if we can grow, as the Bible says, from glory to glory and become better, then let's do it. Right? So let's get into today's sermon. Today we're going to talk about guilt. And I titled it guilt, but really it's guilty? Really? It's a question mark. So, And see, we always hear a lot about about all the other things in, in, in Christianity, all the things about, well, Jesus took away your guilt and your shame. Yes, he did, but have you dealt with it? Have you presented it? Have you brought it before him? Have you brought it before the cross? Have you brought it before God and let him, uh, let him deal with it? Sometimes we feel guilty. Life circumstances leave us feeling guilty. But here's what I found from talking to people, especially over the last few weeks, is that they're confused regret with guilt. Okay, you follow me? Regret and guilt are not the same thing. There are a lot of things in life I regret that I don't feel guilty about. I regret punching a boy in the mouth when in the ninth grade. But I don't feel guilty about it because he deserved every bit of it. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I regret that. Probably should have handled that totally differently. But did he deserve a pop in the mouth? He absolutely did. He poked at the dog on the chain. And he got it. He got bit. So I regret that. There's a lot of things you can regret in life. Uh, things that you've done to other people you regret, but do you feel guilty about it? That's the question. Now, let's look at regret. And I went with the Webster's Dictionary for this. And this, I thought, was because I thought was very good at explaining it. And then it will give you some examples of what regret is. And then we'll compare that to guilt, okay? Regret is to mourn the loss of or death of. That's what regret is. To miss very much. To be sorry for. And then here's how it actually is used in the sentence. It gives you some, some good uh, way to define it. Don't say anything you might regret later. Ooh. Ooh. That one like hit me in the, between the eyes. I deeply regret what I said. Same thing. She does not regret leaving him. He regrets not traveling more when he was younger. He says he doesn't regret anything that he's done in his life. So you see how regret works. It's not really guilt. It's just kind of, well, you know, I kind of feel, I really wish. Usually people say, I wish I had done this instead of doing that. Or I should have probably done something else instead of doing that, right? Uh, like I said a while ago, it's, I, there probably been a better pr approach than punching the boy in the face. But hey, you know what? He he did it. He's the one who poked at the dog. Now guilt. Here's guilt. On the other hand, and this again, it's from the Webster's because I thought it was very clear. The fact of having committed a breach of conduct, okay, especially violating a law and involving a penalty, such as a guilty conduct. Okay? Number two, the state of one who has committed an offense, and that's the word I'm going to use, offender and offended. We're going to use that later on. Okay? And here's another one, feelings of culpability, especially for an imagined offense. Remember what we talked about, Paul said you can become vain in your imaginations? Okay? So you've got an imaginary offense you feel guilty about. We're going to deal with that some too, like self-reproach is the example they use. 
a feeling of culpability for offenses. And, and I gave the definition, culpability simply means that you are the blame for what was done. You're culpable. You know, we read those words, we don't bother to go back and look up, what does culpability mean? It means I did it. That's basically what it means. I'm responsible for what happened. And most often we do feel guilty for what we've done. And this can be overwhelming uh, to us, and it can defile, you know, just about every aspect of our life. Think of it this way. Experiences uh, that create guilt with us can cause us to have nightmares. We have insomnia, which was my case. I didn't sleep for two, three days at a time a lot of times. Self-hatred. Oh, boy, that's a big one for a lot of folks. An inability to love or to be loved. You can't share. You can't reciprocate love and be loved. It's always like someone that has an angle coming after you. They love me, but do they truly love me? You don't trust them. Um, a lack of trust is another one. Depression, self-destructive behaviors, drugs, alcohol. People that get out and get hooked on that kind of stuff. They all become self-destructive. People that go out and do crazy, crazy things, you don't know why they do it. Maybe it's because they're carrying some guilt around with them. Or maybe they've been offended to the point where they don't care anymore. And they're just going to go out and do. Uh, here's another one on, on my eating disorder. You know, that's another big one. Uh, aggressiveness, uh, fear, and then often rage. And so I thought those were just great. They follow right along with what I've been talking about. So aggressiveness, fear, and rage. And then the list of destruction. And it's to your soul. It goes on and on and on and on. I mean, there are many, many more. In fact, it can go so far as to get to the point of suicide or even homicide. A lot of times when that stuff gets that, that bad, you know what I'm saying? So it's a product of, of our own actions. Um, there's a difference between shame. You can feel shameful about what you did, but not necessarily feel guilty. Does that make sense? And here's why. Because shame is, uh, is not uh, the same as guilt. Okay? Guilt is a product of your actions, and the shame is the byproduct of guilt. So the two work hand in hand, but the guilt comes first, and then after that comes the shame. And what I'm telling you today is you don't have to live with that shame. Okay? God says it. Jesus said it. You do not have to live with the shame of what you have done. And guess what? It doesn't matter how bad it is. Go back and look at some of the characters in the Bible and the things they did. Many of us in this room will never even come close to doing what David did. And yet, he's still a man after God's own heart. I've never taken somebody else's husband, sent him out to the front line, and had him killed so I could have his wife for mine and had a baby with him. I've never done that. And so the actions, not, not comparing myself in actions to him, but you see what I'm saying. If we get caught up on that, we're going to miss the whole point that God has taken that shame and that guilt away. He dealt with David. He dealt with Bathsheba. He dealt with that situation. But David went on and still became king. He was still king, and he died being the king. Right? So the punishment is okay. I mean, you, know, you can live through it. He's not going to kill you. That's the whole point about it. Is you, you don't have to live with that shame. Um, because shame is something inside that you need to work on. And we're going to start out, I'm going to give you four basic steps on dealing with, uh, with guilt. Okay? Guilt, shame, whatever. You can interact. You can interchange these words. Because really what it's going to boil down to is sin and faults. That's what it's going to boil down to. But let me give you a, a good definition of shame to work off of. Shame is a painful emotion caused by the consciousness of guilt or the awareness or being aware of guilt. A shortcoming or an impropriety. Uh, then let's, skip, let's go on to number two. A condition of humiliating disgrace or disrepute. In other words, your reputation's been tarnished a little bit. Well, my goodness, I'm 47 years old. I can promise you at some point my reputation has been tarnished just a little bit. If I lived in the shame of that or the guilt of that, then I will never go on and fulfill God's potential for me. If David would have rolled over and said, look at what I did, this is going to ruin my kingdom, this is going to ruin everything I've tried to do, then David would have never been on the king path. He would have never done what God. God says, you did it, we dealt with it, move on, you're the king. You've got to lead Israel. You've got to be the one that takes me to Israel. And that's the same thing with us. If we wallow in our own self-pity and our guilt and our shame, then you're not going to go on and do and carry out the potential that God has given you. You're just not going to do it. You're going to wallow in that shame until you can get up. You're going to hide in a cave like the prophet did until you get up and get out of that shame and self-pity. So, so here's what I found in God's Word, some great insight in dealing with guilt. And there are four ways that we want to approach dealing with this, okay? Self-examination, 
confession, which is very important, forgiveness, the ultimate importance, and then repentance, the finality of the whole thing. Okay? So self-examination, confession, forgiveness, and then repentance. Those are four things I promise will take guilt, shame, and pain away. Okay? Because it's exactly the model that happened with, uh, with everybody who has defeated guilt and let God move in their lives. Uh, number one, examine yourself. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this, and it starts out very powerful. It says, examine yourselves. Right? Don't examine other people. Don't be the one that says, well, boy, you really got all this all messed up, don't you? Well, wait a minute. What about you? Because Jesus said this. You might want to get the plank out of your own eye before you start pulling toothpicks out of somebody else's. Now, that's the old southern way of translating, by the way. That's the Terry Southern version. Uh, take the plank out, you, out of your eye, the two before, before you pull the toothpick out of somebody else's. And so I'm not talking about judgment. We're going to talk a little bit about judgment. There's a difference between judgment and accountability. We're going to talk about that, too. Because God does want you to be accountable, but you're not here to judge other people. Right? right? There is an accountability process he has in place for that. So examine yourselves to see if you are of the faith. What? Here's another one. Test yourselves. Don't you understand that Jesus Christ is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Now, that sounded sarcastic to me. Because <laughs> I don't fail tests. Even if I have to stay up all night studying for it, I ain't failing no test. But it's God's test for you, and it goes on and on and on. It's a test that never ends, so study, 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 right? But I hope that you will realize that we don't fail tests. We pray to God that you don't do anything wrong. That's the key to not failing the test. Don't do anything wrong, not because we want you to appear to pass a test so that you might do the right thing. And I have this thing, do the right thing consistently every time, and I promise you it will not come back and bite you. Do the right thing. It's really the most simple base definition of, of righteousness. Doing the right thing. So examine yourselves. We're constantly reminded of our past by Satan. I mean, we don't need anybody really telling us how bad we were. I know how bad I was. But he's going to use that to remind you, and he's probably going to say something like this. You know, you're way too guilty to seek forgiveness. You're way too guilty to even for God to even look at you and go, you know what, I think I can forgive that. And so we're constantly reminded of that by the enemy. Uh, you feel hopeless. Sometimes you feel rejected and defeated. The reality is that Jesus died to prove just the opposite. Just the opposite. He didn't come to, to die just so that all that can be taken away. He came to put a silence to everything like that. He came to take it away and silence it in your life. You don't have to live this way, he says. So the reality is that Jesus died to prove that. Amen? But sometimes the guilt is so deep that we may not be able to understand what truth really is or what is uh, the truth. And is that that rugged cross that we talked about is where all that was dealt with. That's the truth. We have forgiveness. But to access that forgiveness, we're given some instructions. And one of those is to confess. Confess your sins to God. Now, here's what I thought was very interesting as I looked at this. It says, confess your sins to God. But then you go on and you start reading uh, down in James. It says, confess your faults one to another. So you got a twofold confession here, right? Now, I don't mean going in and confessing to the priest. I don't mean you have to go in there and give 10 or, 10 or 15 penances and go and sit down to the priest. If you won't do that, knock yourself out. That makes you feel good, knock yourself out. But nowhere in here does it say that. It says, confess your sins to God the Father, and he'll forgive you. He's, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And that's uh, 1 John 1, 9, if you're taking notes. And then James 5, 16 says this, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed because, here's why, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much or availeth much. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person can lay devastation on the enemy. It can take away fear. It can take away shame. It can take away pain. And it can take away guilt. Because they're praying for you for the better. So confession is awesome. It's an awesome, awesome tool that we don't take advantage of. We, we're taught, confess your sins to God. But what about confessing your faults one to another? 
But sin is, is kind of defined as this. So let me give you, and the words, two words are used synonymously in the scriptures. If you want to look it up in the Greek, sin and fault. They're two different words Greek-wise, but they're connected together as synonyms. Does that make sense? So it might, it's two words that have the same kind of definition, but they're spelled a little differently. They're linked up together, but a fault is better defined as something else. I'm going to tell you what sin is. Now, Delbert did an example one time in here. Some of you may remember, he got a bow and arrow out, and uh, he took and pulled that bow and uh, arrow back and shot at the arrow. If you hit the target, then that's not sin. But if you miss, if you fall short of the mark, that's sin. And that's very simple. When God sets a mark and you fall short of that, that's sin. And here's what Paul wrote about it. To him that knows to do right and doesn't do it, to him that is sin. So doing the right thing. If you don't do the right thing, you're going to come short of the mark. When you come short of the mark, then you sin. That makes sense. Fault, on the other hand, I'm going to give you a good definition of fault. I thought this was awesome because this was revealed to me earlier. Think of fault as like a fault in the earth where there's something wrong underneath. It's, it's, it has a hollow space under there. There's a fault down in there. And what happens is eventually that fault begins to shift and the earth begins to try to base, balance itself on top of that fault. Instead of being on a solid rock, it's on some airy dirt that has a hole down underneath it. And as that hole gives way, as the fault gives way, then the earth begins to quake. And the destruction comes on the outside because of that, right? So which one caused the destruction? Was it the earthquake or was it the fault? Well, ultimately it became the fault, but it's usually the earthquake that causes. Because the fault, as long as that fault lays dormant and it's not active, then guess what? There won't be an earthquake. Okay? Now let me give you some definitions here right quick. It's going to help you with fault. A uh, fault is simply a weakness. It's a... It's, uh, it's, it's like it said in, in the earth. It's a weakness. It's something that you give into as a weakness, and then that weakness causes the ground to cave in around you, and when it caves in around you, the earthquake happens. So the quakes of your life are usually caused when your faults come to surface, when your weaknesses come to surface. When you give in to a weakness, all of a sudden, boom, the earthquake happens. And it not only damages you, but everything around you comes falling down around your life. And what gets me is a lot of times people go, I don't understand why my life just keeps like it's just falling apart. Well, examine the fault. Find out whose fault it is. And see, in my case, I found a common thread. I looked at everybody out there, and there was only one of them each, but I was in the middle of every bit of it. My name came up every time I examined the situation. So guess where the fault was? Right here, there was a weakness that needed to be fixed. Right? Does that help make sense? So, your faults, you confess your faults, your weaknesses, your shortcomings, things that are going to cause the earthquake, things that are going to lead to sin, you confess those one to another. Now, this is very important. I got this from my wife. This is, was a wonderful illustration. Find somebody that has your best interest at heart. Not somebody who's going to go out and put it before everybody. You don't go out and confess before the entire nation your faults. Trust me, if they've been around you any period of time, they're going to basically know what your faults are anyway. But you go to someone whom you love and trust who has your best interest at heart. That's who you confess your faults to. And it's one to another. It works two ways, folks. You confess your faults one, the another confesses their faults. Right? It ain't like you just go in, sit down before the priest, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Because if he's being honest with you, he'd go, me too. <laughs> for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So me sitting on the other side as another, I don't have any more right than anybody else to look back and go, you know what, you did. Shame on you. No. I look back and go, so did I. And sometimes you'll find out the weaknesses and faults that they have may end up being the same ones you have. And it ain't accidentally that God put you two together. Huh? Because iron sharpens iron. And so shall a man sharpen the countenance of his friend. I don't want to judge. I just want to help. I don't want to be a victim of the earthquake. I want to help you get that fault shored up. And here's the thing. If that fault is going to be there constantly, let's just move a little bit. All we got to do is get out away from it. 
It's kind of like building the house on the shifting sand. That's kind of stupid if you know it's going to fall in, right? We're going to go find some rocks. We can still see the beach and get there, but we don't have to live right on where it's going to cave in the whole time. Point is, you don't have to stay there. You can get away from the fault, right? And then here's another one. Here's one of the ones that I really love. Confessing your sins to God. Confessing your faults one to another. Again, pick somebody who's not going to beat you over the head with a mallet or go out and tell everybody or get on the phone and start calling you and never guess what Terry told me his fault was. <laughs> because I can promise you if they've been around me long enough, they'll go, yeah, I probably can because he stood up and told everybody what his issues were. Yeah, so see what I'm saying? Not all of them. There's some things you don't want to go out and broadcast. But for the most part, find someone. And you'll find, you'll find that what you've done is you've taken the power away from that. See, now that y'all know that, that power and that shame is taken away from me because you know there's no excuse left. Right? Okay. So then the third thing is forgiveness. This is a tough one, boy. Matthew 6, 14. If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So now let's take that and look at it. If you don't, then guess what? He won't. So that one was a tough one for me. I'm going, wait a minute, I want to be forgiven. You mean i got to go forgive people to get that? But, Lord, you don't know what they did. And he says, oh, yes, I do. But I also know what you did. So the judgment is taken away from me. I'm going, oh, so I'm going to be held accountable? Yes, and they will too. So big difference. Forgiveness is kind of hard to work in, but we'll get there. Matthew 6, 15. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your sins. Ouch. How hard is that, right? But let me tell you what I found out. It's the best defense for a person who's been offended by somebody. Forgiveness is. You can put up some great defense if you just offer forgiveness. Jesus said this. Love your enemies. And in doing so, you're going to heap coals of fire on their head. If somebody has offended you, if you'll just keep loving that person, loving that person, loving that person... Guess what? It's the best defense you could put up. Just keep putting that defense up. You know what? Yep, but I love you. Yeah, but I forgive you. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. And I know that's tough. It's very, very tough, you know, because I want vengeance. And it was revealed to me that God says, I'll have vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You know why he says that? And here's what he revealed to me. The reason he told me that, because you don't have to live with what's going to happen to that person. I'm going to do it myself. And you won't carry that guilt the rest of your life because I'm going to deal with that heart. And usually what he does, and here's what we pray for, he makes them better. How about that? How would you like the enemy to get better? Not being an enemy, but how about them being just a great person? Or better yet, getting saved. Really? Really? My enemy can get saved just like I did? Absolutely. How'd you like him sitting beside you in church going, hallelujah? And then you don't have to worry about that anymore. That's why vengeance is the Lord's, not yours. Forgiveness brings freedom. For the offender, God grants forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. None of us have to live with guilt all the time in our lives. We can be liberated. Here's another revelation. God will forgive you, and the truth is, I love this, most people will too. How about that? We don't realize that people can forgive you too. We think this person will never forgive me. How many times have you said that? Oh, Lord, they'll never forgive me. Try it. What's it going to hurt? If they don't, you're no worse off than you were to start with, right? If they do, guess what? you got a new friend. Or at least somebody you can go, they're forgiving me. I've forgiven them. There is no reason for us to have that enmity or that, that distance between us anymore. It's called reconciliation. That's all it's called. We have reconciled. You get reconciled to God, you get reconciled to people. And then you don't have to worry about avoiding them when you see them in the supermarket. Did they see me? I thought, I hope not. <laughs> it takes a lot of courage to enact forgiveness. And I say courage because it's not always easy, easy to put yourself out to someone who's offended you. I mean, it's very, you've got to really choke it up and go, okay. It takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there when you got hurt. If you're an offender, it takes a lot of courage to get out there and ask for forgiveness. Think about that. Sucking it up, going, you know what? I did wrong. I messed up. And here's another one I like. What can I do to make this right? Most people never get that far. They're always like, I did it. So what? You forgive me. I forgive you. Let's move on. No. What can I do to make this right? Is there something I can do to make this right? What do I need to do? Here's a simple answer, and it's number four. 
Here's what you can do to make it right, and here's what you can do to get over being offended. Repent. Repentance. Now, we're taught repentance from sin, right? But we're not taught repentance from your faults, repentance with each other. We're taught that we go to God, we ask for forgiveness and, and, and repent. And if we do that, then he changed from our wicked ways and he'll hear from us. But what about repentance and working it out between each other? Loving your neighbor as you do yourself. Loving your neighbor as, as Jesus loved you. He said that, right? He said, love each other as I have loved you. I give you this command. This is a new command I give you. It's a new law I give you, if you will. A new commandment. Love one another as I love you. And here's what repentance is. It's, and I love this. love this definition. Um, and it's from Luke. I'm, I'm going from Luke 17. We're back in Luke. Watch yourselves. There we are again, right? 17 verse 3. Watch yourselves. Not your brother, but watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, then forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. And that basically means keep forgiving until this whole thing gets fixed. It gets worked out. Because sometimes it may take more than one time. Sometimes it may take a long period of time for things to ever come right, for things to ever get right. But the point is keep working at it. Don't give up. Don't let it win, and don't lose your sanity worrying about it, right? You can be free of that guilt. Keep working at it. What's the harm, like I said? Repentance is a strong weapon for both of us, the offended and the offender. Now, you can decide which one you are. You know, you know where you are. The offended can and should expect repentance, and this is called accountability, by the way. It's not judgment. It's accountability. The offender must change their actions and thoughts so, and to do the right thing by the offended. Now, how tough is that? And that's what you call being accountable. You see, it, it works to the good for both, really, the offended and the offender. So let's think of it in legal terms, and we'll wrap this up. Think of it in legal terms. You're found guilty, right? Let's say you're in a trial. You're found guilty or you found culpable for what happened. The offender is then convicted. Now, who is sent to convict the earth of sins? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit came to convict the earth of sins. And then you're sentenced. And we'll call this accountability. So we have culpability, the Holy Spirit, and the accountability in place. The intensity or the severity of the accountability depends on the history of the defender. That's another thing we've got to look at. Or how much repentance is involved in the offender. And repentance simply means this, to change your mind, to change one's mind to be better, to amend with abhorrence of one's past. That's what repentance really is. It's to change your mind, change the way you do things. So the history of that offender then becomes very important. You have uh, some people that the court calls repeat offenders, people who keep repeating the same offense over and over and over again. And sometimes you have those in your life. Maybe you're one of those. That was kind of what I was doing. Kept repeating the same thing over and over again. Finally I realized, wait a minute, something's wrong. Something's not right. And I got help and I went to some of the folks that I knew would help me and love me. And that's what happened. I began to change. And then you have habitual violators who have, throughout their lifetime, done nothing but the same kind of stuff. And we'll notice those folks. We'll get them into church sometimes and they'll show up for a little while and then they go right back to offended go right back to doing the things that they were doing before they got in and started trying to live right, trying to do the right thing. And that's, I use the term live right because that's really what it is, righteousness doing the right thing. So the history of the offender can tell us a lot about how much repentance has worked into your life. Repeat offenders, habitual violators. Let's don't become either one of those anymore. I'm through being a repeat offender. I want to be straight up. I want to be honest about it. You know, I did it. I messed up. Forgive me. Let's move on. What can I do to make this thing right? And I definitely don't want to become the habitual violator, the one that just don't even take your feelings into account, period, at all. And I'm going to do it. Bless God, that's just the way he is. Well, guess what? It's time to change. If that's just the way you are, it's just the way I am, then it's time to change. You know, we don't have that excuse anymore. Jesus took that excuse away because we don't have to live with this. We can lay it at the foot of the cross. Amen? So let's don't become either one of them. Because guilt does not have to hold us. Your mind doesn't have to be in captivity. Um, follow those steps. Follow those steps uh, through him. And you can avoid the earthquakes that result from failures. Examine yourself and confess your faults. Amen? 
Forgive others as your Father has forgiven you. And then repent and change the way that you live. And here's my charge to you. Live right, live strong, love others, and love yourself. And let's render guilt powerless. Amen? Let's pray.